Hello guys, I'm Dr. Sajjad Pathan and I welcome you to another episode of Teaching and Learning. Today, we shall be looking at another 5 single best answer questions and pick up a few points that will enhance our patient care and our performance in the emergency medicine examination. So, before wasting further time, let us look at the question number 1. Here we are asked, what is the most likely diagnosis? There is a 24-year-old woman who is in the emergency department with complaints of shortness of breath for the last 7 days. It has now worsened so much that she could hardly walk 5 meters without resting to catch her breath. She has no comorbidities and have been doing well otherwise. She has delivered a healthy baby 4 months ago. There is no history of recent viral infection or any medication use. There are no allergies. On auscultation, she has coarse crackles bilaterally and an echocardiogram obtained suggests an ejection fraction of 40%. The ECG suggests sinus tachycardia at 110 per minute. There is bilateral pitting pedal edema but no clear evidence of TBT. There is no evidence of proteinuria on urinalysis. So we have the five options here. Number one, eclampsia. Retained product of conceptions leading to DIC, postpartum cardiomyopathy, postpartum thyrotoxicosis, lastly, pulmonary embolism. Let us now look at the explanation given. The correct answer is the third option. It is postpartum cardiomyopathy. Why I'm saying that is heart failure developing one month before delivery until five months postpartum with no evidence of pre-existing heart disease and an ejection fraction of less than 45% and absence of any recognizable cause. So it fits into the criteria given. In terms of the other options, Eclampsia is hypertension plus proteinuria and seizures. DIC is due to retained product of conception and will likely present early postpartum. Postpartum thyroiditis can cause thyrotoxicosis within the one to three months of pregnancy and then will show signs of hypothyroidism. P is unlikely although pregnancy is a high risk feature but there is no evidence of DVT. Let us now look at question number two. Here we see the question is asking what is the most likely diagnosis? A 22 year old female presents to the emergency department complaining of dizziness for one day. She endorses three days of nasal congestion and rhinorrhea. This morning she awoke with constant severe dizziness and decreased hearing in the left ear. She has never experienced anything like this before. Her vital signs are unremarkable. Physical examination reveals normal tympanic membrane without evidence of infection and the neurology is significant for the right directed horizontal nystagmus. The options given here are caustic neuroma, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, cerebellar infarct, labyrinthitis and Meniere's disease. Let us now look at the explanation. The correct answer to this question is labyrinthitis. That's the option number four. That's deafness, which is unilateral dizziness and tinnitus following a recent respiratory tract infection. Meniere's disease is also known as endolymphatic hydrops, but recurrent episodes or repeated episodes will be we will be able to label them as Meniere's disease. In terms of caustic neuroma, it's a slowly progressing deafness, vertigo and headaches. Benign positional vertigo is dizziness without deafness. And if you're considering cerebellar infarct, the patient should be relatively elderly, multidirectional nystagmus and additional neurological findings. We all must have heard the mnemonic called Danish in terms of cerebellar lesion. It is dystidokinesia which is problem with rapid movements, ataxia of posture or gait, nystagmus which will be multidirectional, intention tremors, slurred staccato speech and hypotonia. Now let us move on to question number three. A five-year-old girl 
with a history of congenital hydrocephalus and a ventriculoperitoneal shunt presents with irritability, nausea and severe headache. The shunt was placed three years ago and has not been revised since. Her vital signs are unremarkable and a physical examination is unrevealing while awaiting neurosurgical consultation. What is the most appropriate step in the management of this patient? Number one, administration of empiric antibiotics for presumed infection. Discharge home with outpatient neurosurgery follower. Emergent operative exploration of the sun shunt system and revision. Order advanced neuroimaging of the brain with an X-ray shunt series. Or the lastly, perform a shunt tap for measurement of her intracranial pressure and evaluation of her CSF. Let us now look at what the explanation is offered over here. The answer is VP shunt blockage or king can present with vague symptoms. So while we are waiting for a neurosurgery consult, please get an MRI or a non-contrast CT head. If that's not available, get a shunt series X-ray while awaiting the neurology opinion. Antibiotics may be eventually required. So the right answer is get the shunt series X-rays. Let us now look at question number four. An 80 year old man presents with low back pain that has been worsening over the past few months. He denies recent trauma, neurologic deficits, bowel or bladder incontinence, saddle anesthesia, intravenous drug use, recent spinal procedure or dysuria. His vital signs are within normal limits. His exam is significant for midline tenderness to palpation with a normal neurological exam, good rectal tone and enlarged smooth prostrate and a negative stool white testing. His labs are significant for a hemoglobin of 8.2, white blood cells of 9.8, platelets of 200 and a calcium of 10.7. Lumbar sacral radiographs are obtained and demonstrate multiple lytic lesions. What is the most likely diagnosis? Is it abdominal aortic aneurysm leak, multiple myeloma, cord equina syndrome, prostate cancer meds or conus medullaris syndrome? Let us now look at the explanation. The answer is multiple myeloma. Think of it like that. Anemia with hypercalcemia. Anemia with hypercalcemia with a punched out lytic lesion in the skull or vertebra. How do you diagnose that? Serum and urine electrophoresis. You guys must remember the lower back pain red flags. That is called as tuna fish trauma. Unexplained type B symptoms, fever, night sweats, weight loss, neurological deficits, incontinence, weakness, age greater than 55 or 60 years, fever, IV drug abuser, steroid use or history of active cancer. Now let us look at question number 5. You're caring for a 35 week pregnant in your department who's admitted for shortness of breath. Which of the following is not seen typically in pregnancy wow they are asking about normal physiological changes in pregnancy and the options given are decreased in central venous pressure decreased oxygen reserves increase in cardiac output increase in heart rate or an increased hematocrit Hematocrit is your RBC concentration upon the plasma volume. Plasma volume increases by 50% in a pregnant lady. RBC increases by 15 to 20%. But overall, there is a reduced hematocrit. This is also known as physiological anemia of pregnancy. CVP is decreased due to IVC compression. And remember that minute ventilation increases as the tidal volume increases not the respiratory rate. Respiratory rate relatively remains the same throughout the pregnancy. Before we end this session, let us recap the final take home points today. Postpartum cardiomyopathy, heart failure, one month antepartum to five months postpartum with no previous cardiac issues and ejection fraction of less than 45. Danish is for the cerebellar signs, this didokinesia, ataxia of gait and posture, nystagmus, which is multidirectional, intention, tremor, slurred, staccato speech, hypotonia. 
headache or lethargy in a child with VP shunt, do a shunt series imaging and get a neuro opinion. And remember, tuna fish are the red flags for the low back pain. Low back pain in the elderly demands a AAA exam. IVDU may have a spinal epidural abscess. And finally, know your physiological changes in pregnancy. That's very important. Thank you for watching this video till the end. If you like it, please do share, subscribe and like the video. If you have any comments or would like to see videos specific to any topic, please post your comment below. Stay safe, stay blessed and save lives. Peace.